Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Center for Global Humanities at the University of New England. Uh, we are very delighted that you are able to take some time to join us in this virtual event, a very, very special event. And we'll tell you why in a second. You probably have seen the program. Um, but today, uh, on the eve of a major election, um, perhaps a historic election, uh, we have one of the most renowned and accomplished authors and journalists with us tonight uh, to talk about one aspect of the conversation that has been ha taking place in the last few years. And then, um, and then we'll, uh, after his presentation, we'll open it up for a, a, a conversation between the two of us, uh, which should also be hopefully interesting. So a very brief biographical note about the, the speaker, David Rode. He was born, in, well, he, he's actually a native of Maine. And then he went to Bates College before he went to Brown University. So he's home, literally home. And actually, he's joining us from Kennebunkport, if I'm not mistaken, tonight. Yep, yep. Uh, he's an American author and investigative journalist uh, who currently serves as the online news director for the New Yorker magazine. Uh, while a reporter for the Christian Science Monitor, he won the Pulitzer Prize for International Reporting in 1996 uh, for his coverage of the Srebrenica uh, massacre. From 2002 to 2005, he was co-chief of the New York Times South Asia Bureau, a base in New Delhi, India. He later contributed to the newspaper's team coverage of Afghanistan and Pakistan and re received the 2009 Pulitzer Prize uh, for international reporting and was a finalist uh, in his own right in the category, uh, uh, in, the category in, in 2010. He's also a global affairs analyst for CNN. While in Afghanistan, a road was kidnapped. Uh, this is one interesting aspect of David's life by members of the Taliban uh, in November 2008. But he managed to escape in June 2009 after seven months in captivity. Uh, while he was in captivity, the New York Times collaborated with a number of media outlets, including Al Jazeera and Wikipedia, to remove news of the kidnapping from the public eye. So uh, uh, he is the author of several books, and I'm going to mention some names. Endgame, The Betrayal and Fall of Srebrenica, Europe's Worst Massacre Since World War II. Another book, A Safe Area, Srebrenica, uh, Europe's Worst Massacre Since the Holocaust, 1997. And with his wife, Kristen Mul 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 Mulvihill, A Rope and a Prayer, A Kidnapping from Two Sides, 2010. And most recently, uh, he just published a book, which is going to be the subject of tonight's event. Uh, it's called In Deep, the FBI, the CIA, and the Truth Amer About America's Deep State. Uh, so without, uh, without further ado, I will now leave you with our distinguished speaker, David Rode, and then we'll, I'll get back to, we'll get back together for a Q&A session afterwards. David? Thank you, uh, Anwar, for that incredibly uh, generous introduction. Um, uh, yes, I'm down in uh, Kennebunkport, uh, living with my in-laws uh, in the wake of the pandemic. It's changed uh, all of our lives. We're very lucky to have this uh, place to go. Um, I love being back in Maine. Um, in addition to going to Bates, I'm a proud graduate of Freiburg Academy up in Freiburg, Maine. Uh, and my father also lives by uh, here in Kennebunk, just the one town over. So I love this great state, and I'm so grateful and honored and thrilled that you've invited me to give this talk at uh, UNE. Uh, your your uh, Biddeford campus is is about five miles from where I'm talking to you from in uh, Kennebunkport. Um, I'll talk about this book, as you said, Anwar, and then we'll have a discussion. I'm, I want to broaden the discussion out, but I'll, I'll first uh, talk about this book for about 30 minutes. Um, and, you know, as the lecture says, the American uh, deep state. Um, I, I wrote this book to try to answer that question, sort of, is there an American uh, deep state? And what does a sort of deep state uh, mean? And the book is sort of a history, the first half of it, of, um, you know, how does a democracy, how does the United States protect itself, you know, uh, from foreign rivals? How does it protect its citizens uh, from criminals? You know, how does it have intelligence agencies and, and law enforcement agencies, very powerful federal ones, how does it control them? How does it keep them legal? How does it, how do you, you know, prevent powerful government organizations from abusing their own uh, citizens? And, you know, this whole issue, you know, you mentioned the election, Anwar, I completely agree. It's a historic election. 
I think trust in, in government, um, which has declined over time, you know, the pandemic is showing us how important I think trust in government is. And I think there's, you know, deep suspicion of government on both the right and the left. Um, just again, in terms of the pandemic, you know, the scientific experts who who should be trusted, you know, should schools remain opened or closed? Should people be wearing masks? I didn't write about the pandemic. I finished the book before the pandemic started, but it's the same theme of can we trust these sort of unelected government experts that make these critical uh, decisions in our lives? Um, the book primarily focuses on the FBI and CIA, and it, it talks about a period in the 1970s when uh, there was an investigation of, of what the FBI and CIA had been doing um, in the United States. And before I talk about the investigation, I wanna say one other thing. I wrote this book also because of a poll that came out um, in 2018. It was taken by Monmouth University. And the, the suspicion of government, the belief that there is a deep state um, is widespread on both the right and the left. Um, asked, uh, Americans were polled and they were asked by Monmouth University do you think there's a group of unelected uh, government officials and generals who secretly influence policy in Washington? Over 70% of Americans from both sides of the political spectrum said yes. Um, but there tends to be a different view on the right and the left of what is the danger, what is the deep state. Uh, conservatives tend to use the term the administrative state. And to conservatives, that's an ever-growing federal government that's you know, relentlessly and ceaselessly encroaching on people's personal lives taking away uh, our, our freedoms and, and trying to tell us how to live. Um, on the left, there's a very strong fear of the military industrial complex. There's a sense that uh, a cabal of generals and large defense firms have sort of pushed the country into war after war and that they are the unelected officials in Washington that, that should be feared. But again, it's, it's both sides that um, are not trusted. And, and again, before I go into the history, I think that the entire American establishment, the mainstream media included, and I am, and I, know, and I will talk about this, you know, the very definition of the mainstream media, um, like it or not. And I know many people distrust and, and dislike the mainstream media. Um, but as Anwar mentioned, I, I started out my career, I worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer, covering schools in Philadelphia school board meetings. And then I worked for the Christian Science Monitor and covered the war in Bosnia. I spent 15 years at the New York Times. That's the epitome of the mainstream media that, and I know the Times frustrates many conservatives. I work for Reuters and a news agency, an international news agency that, that tends to be very neutral. And I'm now at the New Yorker magazine. So uh, we'll talk later about how the media and the establishment as, whole, as a whole, from government officials to public health experts to journalists, you know, I think this is a, a time of, of reckoning for us that we all need to sort of examine what we've done wrong, um, how have we lost people's trust and, and how can we regain it? Uh, people tend to be critical of President Trump and that, that he is the source of the problem. Um, you know, I'll talk about that in detail, but I think that there's a broader lack of confidence in government that everyone in universities, in the media, in government needs to face. Uh, and we need to, it's not a problem that will go away if Donald Trump doesn't win next Tuesday. We, as you know, I feel privileged. We as members of this country's elite have to ask ourselves hard questions about what have we done wrong? Now to the history, sorry for the delay. Um, the history here is that the FBI and CIA do have a history of carrying out abuses against American uh, citizens. Um, as I said earlier, the book starts with an investigation into misconduct by the FBI and CIA. Uh, it was carried out by, surprisingly, a liberal Democrat from Idaho. There were liberal Democrats from Idaho then, Senator Frank Church, and a conservative from Texas named John Tower. They uh, led what was called the Church Commission, and it was a about year, 18-month-long investigation into what the CIA and FBI had done during the Cold War to American citizens. This was coming at a time when the country was deeply divided and traumatized uh, from Vietnam, the death of 50,000 Americans, from assassinations of American leaders, from you know, riots and protests for many, many years, and then, of course, Watergate and the, the resignation of, of President Nixon. The church committee and its findings added to a already deep sense that government could not be trusted. Um, 
one of the characters in the book, one of the people I interviewed was a gentleman named Fritz Schwartz, a, a sort of uh, trivia quiz for folks who are watching. Fritz uh, Schwartz's middle initials were AO. So his initials were FAO Schwartz. Um, if you're familiar with New York City, uh, he is a member of the wealthy family that started the FAO Schwartz toy store. Um, Schwartz, though, became a lawyer. Uh, other members of his family ran the toy store, and he was the lead investigator on the church committee. And he spent months and months in 1975 and 1976 interviewing the top spy masters at the CIA, uh, the senior officials at the FBI, about they were press reports about abuses that they had carried out. Um, the director of the CIA at the time, William Colby, decided to come clean and share with the committee a secret document that the CIA had put together that was called the Family Jewels. It was in all of the secret programs they had carried out throughout the Cold War. And uh, Schwartz also had access to thousands of pages, tens of thousands of pages of FBI files. What was interesting when I met Schwartz was that he himself was a member of the American elite. He, he was from this family. He went to private school in Manhattan. He went to Harvard. He was essentially an Ivy League wasp. The Ivy League wasp at that point sort of dominated the CIA. And Schwartz expected that in his interviews with FBI and CIA agents, he would identify more with CIA agents because many of them were also wasps and sort of Ivy League students who had been recruited into the CIA. To Schwartz's surprise, he liked the FBI agents better. They seemed more human to him. What, what amazed him was the skill with which uh, heads of the CIA could lie to him, that he would sit and interview them for hours and hours and, and, and he would have trouble keeping straight what was the truth and what was a lie. His meetings with CIA agents, he found them to be much more human. Uh, they tended to be not from elite Ivy League universities. Many of them went to Fordham University, which is a fantastic uh, Jesuit university in, in New York City. Uh, many of them tended to be Catholics. And what the um, FBI agents told him was that they, they, had in, they had done things that were illegal in an effort to defend the country. Um, and that they felt they had to take these steps in order to preserve the United States from communism, to save its way of life, to save American democracies, democracy and freedom. But the findings of the report you know, undermined those denials. Uh, the CIA had opened Americans' mail uh, for decades. Uh, during Vietnam War protests, uh, the CIA carried out surveillance on tens of thousands of Americans. Uh, they tracked foreigners who were in the country. One of the persons that the CIA illegally surveilled during Vietnam protests was John Lennon of the Beatles. Uh, the FBI had a list of 23,000 Americans that uh, former FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover uh, said would be jailed in case of emergency. Uh, that list included doctors and scientists and the writer Norman Mailer. Uh, the FBI, uh, without any approvals from, judge, from judges, uh, infiltrated uh, political organizations on the right and the left. FBI agents infiltrated uh, and broke into the homes and set up wiretaps of members of the John Birch Society on the right and students uh, for a democratic society on the left. And a particular target of Hoover's was civil rights group and specifically Dr. Martin Luther King. Hoover, uh, this was all uncovered by the church committee, um, targeted King, uh, bugged his hotel rooms. And at one point, uh, King uh, had FBI, I'm sorry, Hoover had FBI agents write an anonymous letter to King uh, and send him an audio tape. And it was an audio tape of what they said, uh, you know, that showed King had engaged in infidelity on his wife. Uh, they sent a copy of the tape to his wife also. And this anonymous letter that was from FBI agents but not sound, signed urged King uh, to commit suicide before he went to accept the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize uh, in Europe. Uh, King didn't take that advice, but all of this misconduct was uncovered by the church committee. Uh, this added to American sort of cynicism about the government. It added to its fears of about America's spies and, and G-men, if you will, at the FBI. But what was amazing, and I, I want to, I am optimistic, and again, Anwar and I will talk about this more. Think about that time period. Again, a foreign war with 50,000 dead, a president has resigned, you know, tremendous racial and political strife, protests on the streets. But the church committee came out with 69 bipartisan recommendations to try to restore control over the FBI and the CIA and government workers in general. 
And there was a tremendous number of those reforms enacted first by Gerald Ford, who was the president when the report came out, and then Jimmy Carter. So in an effort to control the CIA, Gerald Ford issued an executive order barring the CIA from operating inside the United States, period. That was to stop. Uh, he barred the CIA from carrying out assassinations abroad. Uh, Carter enacted an executive order that when, that when the CIA carried out covert actions abroad, in the past, there had just been these casual conversations between presidents and CIA directors. But under this reform, the CIA had to present a written letter a covert action finding is the, the full term for it, that the president had to sign. It would describe the covert action that the CIA was gonna, going to carry out. The president had to sign it. And then copies of that covert action finding were given to the heads of both parties in Congress. Uh, there was also new committees created in Congress to oversee the intelligence community. Those were the House and Senate intelligence committees. Those findings that would describe covert action also went to the chairs of those committee and the ranking members. And the point was to distribute oversight of the FBI and the CIA. One other additional step to prevent the illegal wiretaps that I mentioned was that there was a federal court created to oversee all wiretaps carried out by the FBI that involved uh, foreign intelligence. It was called the Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act uh, was the law, and it was called the FISA court. And that created a system where the FBI couldn't surveil Americans unless they had the approval of a FISA court judge. Um, so again, the goal is that Congress and the judiciary are also overseeing the FBI and CIA and also ensuring that they don't engage in misconduct. This was popular at the time in the late 70s. It was, again, after Watergate in Vietnam, and there was a, a real sense among Americans that the government was out of control. But there were some people that thought these reforms went too far. There was one aide to President Carter in particular, who was concerned that the presidency was being weakened too much by giving these oversight powers to the courts and to Congress. Uh, that young aide to President Ford was Dick Cheney. Uh, he worked in the Ford White House. Uh, we'll get back to, to Cheney later. But he was part of a group of conservative thinkers that felt that after Watergate, the presidency was weakened too much. After he left office, President Ford agreed with them uh, and started giving speeches saying that Congress had overreached and the judiciary was becoming too powerful. Um, a big influential member of that group was also uh, the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, um, Donald Rumsfeld, who was also an aide to President Ford, he also opposed this. And there was a young man whose name might sound familiar to you, um, who was at that point a young lawyer uh, working in the Reagan White House that also became concerned about the president's power being weakened. Uh, and his name is Bill Barr. Um, a series of scandals unfold uh, in the 80s that tests this new uh, oversight system. Uh, I won't go into too much detail for folks, but you, you may remember the Iran-Contra affair. And that was where um, the CIA had given, uh, sold weapons to Iran and used the profits to provide support and fundings to the Contras in Central America. Um, they, they violated the, the new guidelines set up by Ford where Congress was supposed to be told about these covert actions. Uh, there was a big investigation. Uh, President Reagan apologized to the country. He said that there should be these guidelines. Presidents you know, should have to inform Congress uh, and the system, this new oversight system uh, essentially worked. Um, sort of fast forwarding to the Clinton years, um, there's activities by the federal government that very much worries conservatives. Um, the, there's a raid uh, on Ruby Ridge, it's become uh, folklore now, but it was ATF agents that were trying to apprehend one man on, on weapons charges. Uh, his son was killed, his wife was killed in a series of shootouts and a, a sniper uh, firing as well. Uh, and it was seen as federal law enforcement overreach and an extremely dangerous thing that happened. Um, after that, there was the siege of the Branch Davidian compound um, in Texas, in Waco, Texas. Uh, that went on, again, I don't know the age of our average viewers here, but that dragged on for weeks. Uh, the FBI attempted to end the siege by sending forward these sort of armored vehicles and firing tear gas into the compound where the Branch Davidians were surrounded. Fires broke out uh, and more than 80 people died, including more than a dozen children. Um, there were reports from survivors that the Branch Davidians started the fires themselves. There was evidence that some of these tear gas canisters may have lit the fire by the FBI, but those two incidents, Ruby Ridge and Waco, 
under the Clinton administration created a deep fear on the right that the FBI and the ATF and federal law enforcement was sort of out of control. Um, the, the, this oversight system again loses credibility after the 9-11 attacks. At that point, Dick Cheney has become the vice president of the United States. Uh, the country wants aggressive actions by the government and the intelligence agencies to protect them. So Bush and Cheney launch a massive domestic surveillance program and they privately decide that the president has the power to surveil anyone they want. And they carry this out without the approval of a federal judge. Um, it's eventually leaked uh, to the New York Times and, and the, uh, the surveillance program is, is stopped. But this is an example of how the oversight systems um, continues to be weakened over time uh, after 9-11. Um, Barack Obama becomes president. And just again, on this last issue of the power of a president, the executive branch's power, uh, Obama embraces the use of drone strikes that the United States government should carry out drone strikes abroad to protect Americans from their own, from, from terrorism. But uh, Obama carries out uh, an unusual drone strike. Um, it's against Anwar al Awlaki. Uh, he is a Yemeni American citizen um, who eventually backs Al Qaeda and flees to Yemen and is posting online videos urging people to carry out attacks in the United States. Uh, there's a uh, Major Nadal Hassan, um, an American, carries out a shooting attack in Fort Hood, Texas, that's inspired by Anwar al Awlaki. But what's extraordinary is that a US drone. Uh, you know, they get information and they fire a missile in Yemen at Anwar al Awlaki. He is an American citizen. That drone strike is successful. It kills Anwar al Awlaki. But under Obama, you have the United States government executing an American citizen by drone strike with no court proceeding whatsoever, no presentation of evidence against him that he somehow committed a crime. Um, and that form of, of, um, Executive power uh, scares people on the right and the left. Edward Snowden uh, leaks surveillance that the NSA has been doing. That Obama era surveillance had been approved by judges. It was different from what Bush and Cheney had done. But all of these factors are sowing, you know, distrust in government on both both the right and the left. Uh, in 2016, Donald Trump emerges on the scene, and I'll talk a little bit about my own reporting. Um, on the famous dossier and some of the, the, the claims about uh, President Trump. But he, he runs on a, you know, and, and Anwar and I have talked about this earlier, and we'll talk about it again, you know, a deep sense among Americans that the country is increasingly unequal economically, a sense uh, by folks, uh, some maybe up in, in rural parts of Maine, like Freiburg, where I went to high school, that the opiate crisis and that small towns were being uh, ignored by the sort of liberal elite in Washington and in, in the coastal cities. Um, and um, Trump campaigns. I'm a reporter at Reuters, a news agency I mentioned, and I'll just tell a few stories about the dossier and the reporting I did then. Um, many, many news organizations were given this dossier uh, that was produced uh, by a former British spy. Uh, his work was initially funded by a Republican donor the Hillary Clinton's campaign then, then funded uh, the, the former British spy's work, uh, Christopher Steele. Um, there was a firm called GPS Fusion, a sort of private investigative firm, a campaign opposition research firm that was run by two former journalists from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and in the summer of 2016, uh, they gave the dossier to news organizations all over Washington. Uh, a colleague of mine at Reuters was given a, a copy um, of the dossier. And in the summer of 2016, I investigated it. Uh, part of the dossier mentioned that there was a Trump foreign policy advisor named Carter Page who was secretly meeting with Igor Sechin, a top aide to Vladimir Putin. Uh, in July of 2016, I approached a senior official at the Justice Department whose job it was, was to sort of track, um, you know, whether there were these conversations going on, was you know, and, and would have been uh, possibly trying to surveil. Carter Page uh, and see you know, whether he was actually having these meetings or not. And I asked this Justice Department official, is this true? You know, is Carter Page a Trump aide meeting with a top aide to Vladimir Putin? And the Justice Department official refused to give me any comment. Uh, later on in the summer of 2016, 
Um, I was doing a story on the CIA and John Brennan, the then CIA director, um, and about his reforms of the CIA, but I, I met him and I'll, I'll never forget this part. I was um, in the CIA headquarters and uh, taken up to his office. Uh, it's in Langley, Virginia, the famous Langley. And you're up on the top of this building and you look out the window and it's this beautiful sort of, remember this verdant sort of green canopy of trees out the window of the CIA director's office. Um, but you know, I was there as a journalist, it was my job to ask some questions. So I said, uh, Director Brennan, you know, we have this document, this dossier that claims that Russia has uh, incriminating videotapes from a Moscow hotel room of the Republican party nominee, Donald Trump. You know, can you, Mr. Brennan, give me any guidance? I, I asked him, there were a couple of press assistants in the room also who worked for the CIA. Can you give me any guidance at all on this? Uh, you know, is this true? You know, do, do does the Russian government have compromising material on the Republican nominee? And I remember Brendan getting very quiet. And then he sort of said, I, I'm not commenting on this in any way, shape or form. Uh, Brendan said, I'm not confirming this thing that you've heard. I'm not denying this thing that you've heard. I don't you know, know anything about it. Um, and then Brendan told me, you know, at that point, it was, I think, mid-September, he said, you know, we're about six weeks away from the election, and I want to urge you, David, to be very careful about what you report in the next few weeks. Um, you're going to hear crazy things about Hillary Clinton. You're going to hear crazy things about Donald Trump. Don't print things that you can't confirm. There's a lot of sort of false information out there. Uh, I'm proud to say that the Reuters, where I worked, and the vast majority of American news organizations uh, before the 2016 election did not print anything that was in the dossier. We couldn't confirm what was in the dossier. We therefore didn't print it. Um, they were wild allegations, but again, we didn't print any of it. I think there was one piece that ran online just before the election, but it didn't get much coverage. Um, all of that changes after the election. Uh, the dossier is printed by BuzzFeed, the online news outlet. Uh, President Trump, President-elect Trump is furious. Um, he is convinced that the FBI and CIA leaked the contents of the dossier. Uh, I know that in my case, it did not come from the FBI or the CIA. And I also know that Justice Department officials and, and Mr. Brennan, John Brennan, you know, wouldn't confirm it for me. Uh, my father-in-law, who might be watching this right now, I'm not sure, um, thinks that John Brennan was lying to me that day. But I'm just, I swear to you, that's what he said to me. Um, it, it's, it, you know, Carter Page it later emerges, was actually under surveillance by the FBI. Um, he, wa he was being looked at by the Justice Department. Uh, a judge did approve the surveillance of Carter Page, but in the application for that surveillance, uh, an FBI lawyer uh, changed a document uh, to change its meaning, to have it say, instead of it saying that Carter Page was cooperating with the CIA, uh, it, it, the document told the judge, that he was not cooperating with the CIA. Um, and then, so he, he was surveilled. Uh, there was a big investigation of this by the Justice Department Inspector General, and it was found that Carter Page was surveilled for too long by the FBI. Um, as many of you know, President Trump argued that he never should have been surveilled. Uh, the president also made other claims that haven't turned out to be true. He said that Trump Tower was surveilled. That, that has not happened, at least according to the Inspector General and the uh, an investigation of, of the FBI's conduct by the Republican controlled Senate Intelligence Committee. All of this is to say that today, as we're nine days away from this election, all of these issues, you know, what is the FBI doing? What is the CIA doing? Are they trying to undermine President Trump? Is Anthony Fauci a nonpartisan public health expert, or is he actually being partisan and, and hurting President Trump? These central questions about government officials, government agencies, you know, are central to this election. Um, and just the last thing, last week, President Trump issued an executive order. It didn't get that much um, publicity, but President Trump's proposal, um, if he's reelected, uh, right now, when an American president takes over, they appoint about 4,000 employees at the top of the government. They're political appointees that can be hired and fired by the president. But the vast majority of the 2 million federal workers in the government are supposed to be nonpartisan civil servants who 
who work for president after president. Uh, they're supposed to be not corrupt and subject matter experts. Again, I would use the Tony Fauci example. Under this executive order carried out by President Trump, he would vastly expand the number of federal employees that are appointed, uh, hired or fired by the president. It would go from roughly 4,000 to as many as 100,000. Uh, Democrats said this is a you know, recipe for patronage and the president's friends get the jobs and you just have political loyalists presenting the sort of rosiest picture about labor policy, education policy, uh, you know, you name it, climate change. Um, uh, the president says he, that he needs now to have more control over the federal workforce to present, sorry, to prevent this deep state from thwarting him from carrying out the agenda that Americans have elected him uh, to implement. Um, I'm going to end there where it's, it's just after 6.30, um, bringing us up to the present stage. And I'm now look forward to a long conversation with Anwar um, about these various topics. I hope that history helped give you some context that we have, uh, the last thing, we have faced crises of confidence like this before. We've been deeply divided as a country. I'm convinced we can get through this period, come up with reforms and uh, change the government or at least you know, increase public trust in it over time. Well, thank you, David. That's what a great presentation. Well, I, <laughs> I'm going to take a breath now. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Well, where do I start? I read your book very carefully. Thank I paid... you so much for doing that. And and he has, so watch out, everybody. I, is, I have I, 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 I do have pages of notes. But I guess yeah. like one of one one place to start, like uh, one place to start would be the the critical essay that you mentioned in the book, but it was published by Virgil, the anonymous person Correct. at Breitbart News. December 12, 2016, and he, it's not, it's an intelligent piece. I found it to be an intelligent piece. In that way, he describes the deep state. And by the way, thank you so much also for mentioning Peter Scott, Dale Scott in The Road to 9-11. That's a book that I had read after 9-11. It was incredible. It's an incredible analysis all the way up to the 9-11 and how the deep state, Rumsfeld and Cheney and, and those people who believe in a strong presidency Yes. Uh, to counter the, uh, it's a very interesting, that's a different kind of conversation. But he, but uh, Virgil, the anonymous person in this, in this essay, uh, talks about um, the, immediately after the election of Donald Trump, there's been a, a process was set in place, whether to, de, uh, to somehow change the outcome of the electoral college, or uh, there were attempts yeah. to convince the members of that college to uh, not to vote for him or, or to sabotage or to, to bring to their attention this Russian hacking uh, the, of the election. And then, of course, you know, you have someone like David Brooks writing an essay on November 11th in the, in, the, in the New York Times saying, uh, basically writing this, I'm quoting, that Trump would probably resign or be impeached within a year. Uh, the, f the future is closer than you think. Uh, and then um, there are leaks and all kinds of things. And so, so what the, the author does mention here, it is a vast bureaucracy in the United States. If you, if you add local, state, and federal government, which is up to 22 million people, plus an unknown number of contractors who work for the, for the federal government, I don't know how, they all have a huge vested interest in the status quo. And... Yes. Uh, and so I think with that definition, uh, if you have someone as a disruptive as Donald Trump coming in and trying to drain the swamp and, and all of those things and trying to change the ways of Washington, basically he's upsetting a status quo that, both, that includes both Republicans and Democrats. So is that, is, is, is that, so is that why he's possibly feeling that he's getting some pushback retaliation or is it something is possible or not? What, what, what do you think of this? So he does feel that since the beginning of his presidency, uh, you know, this is the, the Washington. So, you know, it's great that you mentioned the Breitbart story. Um, the term deep state really wasn't used in the United States until that Peter Dale Scott mm -hmm. was the, the deep state term was first used and it was actually used by political scientists. You would know this better than me to talk about Turkey and the, the sort of, you know, military there and maybe Egypt and how they would block democracy. The first person to apply it to the United States government was Peter Dale Scott. Um, 
whose book you read, but those are, and then um, he talks a little bit about the deep state on Alex Jones's radio show, but in, all the way through the election of Donald Trump, the deep state is not a well-known term in the United States. It is this article in Breitbart that you mentioned that introduces it to a broad conservative audience, but, and it is from the perspective of an ever-growing government. I think it's important and we'll, we can debate this. Um, deep state is a, it's a, Donald Trump is an extraordinary communicator. He's incredibly good at messaging. So calling people members of the deep state is a very effective way to kind of discredit them. And then I've had uh, people who work with the president say he's, he's a product of the kind of New York real estate world where everyone is kind of, you know, exaggerating a bit or making their development sound a little better. And it's very high, you know, intensity. So the president is very skeptical of the idea of a nonpartisan kind of government workforce. So, um, and, and then conservatives want a smaller government. So all that came together. And then, and then I would say the last thing that happened is that it, it was wrong. Um, I mean, opinion columnists can write in and they want. There were officials in the government who said, you know, who said at the time that they wouldn't carry out um, Trump's orders. An elected president of the United States should have his policy implemented by government workers. If a government worker doesn't want to implement the policy, then they should resign. So I think it's it's it was wrong for kind of David Brooks to be predicting, you know, uh, he was going to be impeached so quickly. Um, it's wrong for people in the government. You know, if, if an order is illegal or unethical, then, you know, a civil servant or a soldier shouldn't carry it out. But, you know, the, the power in this country should ri should should reside with an elected president, not, um, you know, members of the press or or um, civil servants who don't want to go along with them. But the so the Breitbart party says that I think it was like that, you know, it was the deep state versus Donald Trump. And that article predicted there was going to be a great power struggle that was starting in 2016. We've watched it, you know, occur over the last four years. Um, I'll just say I think the president has exaggerated some of the things that um, like Brennan. I mean, we can, you know, neither of us will be able to answer the question, but. You know, there's some supporters of the president who said John Brennan was running around giving everybody the dossier. That wasn't my personal experience, but I um, we've talked about this war anyway. I think the president is right about the issues he raises: inequality, rural areas being ignored, China. You know, the question is, um, is he given credit for when he comes up with a solution? You know, uh, by the press, I know many people feel not. Um, and then there is, I think, a need for civil service reform. It's very hard to fire government workers. But is there a plot? You know, is there a coup? And I did not find evidence of a, you know, a coup being plotted in a basement in, in Northern Virginia. Uh, um, talking about a coup, I just wanted to share with you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to share. I'm going to keep talking, but yeah. I, I'm, my, my, my computer looks like it's not plugged in properly. So you talk. I'm going to lean over. This is the Zoom moment. Okay. And make sure this power cord we're, is in correct. We are being Keep, watched right. You and I are being watched right now. Why? I know. Okay. I know. Okay. I know I'm uh, live. I'm explaining okay. to people why okay. I'm going to okay. lean good. over okay. right okay. now. Okay. Okay. Good. But you ask your next question. All right. So basically, here's a here's an article from the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> by Go this ahead. is by Ron Johnson, Senator Ron Johnson, and he it does mention a coup, a coup attempt. You know, going through the history you gave us. Yes. It, this came out. I don't know. You probably saw this earlier the month in the in, in Wall Street Journal. So it, the word coup is mentioned. But but what's very interesting is is um, I agree with you. I don't think I think things are way too complex for coups. You know, uh, to happen with that kind of precision, with that kind of uh, planning, or, and and so on. But there is a consensus. There are interests at stake. And um, I was going to. Uh, and so this this kind of raises the the debate about. Um, well, let me ask you this question before we move on to larger issues. Do you has there ever been a case like this in which a president elect has been subjected to this kind of scrutiny and and resistance, quote unquote? Because you know we know that on inauguration on this inauguration day, there's an article in the Washington Post, people claiming they want to do a. Uh, the campaign to impeach Trump has begun. That's what that's the title of that article. And then embedded in that article, there was a a video by Michael with Michael Moore giving a talk to to the public and saying basically that 
uh, Trump uh, will not last these four years. So when, when you are in the, in the president-elect and you hear this constantly, like people are wanting to get you and take you down and everything else, uh, so in a way they're complicit. The media has been complicit or the mainstream media has been complicit along with other elements in society in producing and hardening the, or maybe, of, of, uh, maybe even inflaming the flaws of this candidate whom they're not crazy about instead of, what, what do you think of that? I, so I did have intelligence officials say to me, one of them was Michael Morell. He was the deputy director of the CIA, um, that the CIA's initial interactions with Trump didn't help the situation. Michael Morell wrote an op-ed for the New York Times in 2016, and he endorsed Hillary Clinton for president. He now feels that was a mistake because that played into the president's you know, fear of these intelligence uh, agencies. Um, soon after Brennan left office, he's a private citizen. He, you know, he argues he has a right to express his political opinions. You know, he, he was very offended by the a speech that Trump gave in the lobby of the CIA, where he said, I know most people here, you know, voted for me. Um, and uh, he started tweeting these sort of attacks on um, Trump. We can get into Jim Comey and that's complicated. But Comey also, you know, in his book, becomes a very partisan figure. So I think a mistake that was made, and, and there's, there are kind of current FBI and CIA officials agree, and this is kind of the core question. They think that intelligence, CIA and FBI officials, even when they retire, should be apolitical. That you need, they think there can be nonpartisan public service. The president and many people question whether that's even possible. They, they say that's some pie in the sky idea. So they think that, that, that what Comey and Brennan uh, and Jim Clapper, who's in my book too, mm -hmm. the former director of national, that all of their kind of very public attacks on Trump, um, you know, helped turn Trump against them and played into Trump's narrative. I will say that, you know, the president's rhetoric <laughs> and his tweets also kind of creates this, this you know, um, an atmosphere of, of recrimination and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, and again, it's, it's effective communications. Um, you know, he felt the Mueller being appointed was unfair, but, you know, he, he, um, you know, it's, it's, a the name calling, how about that on both sides, I think doesn't help, but uh, there were mistakes. I think I, so this is where I, but my, one of my core arguments in the book is let's double down on nonpartisan public service. M maybe that's impossible. And I, that includes journalism. So the last thing is reporters like me should be presenting facts. Uh, polls show people want this, um, but there's this, this sort of explosion and particularly on the web of, of opinion that we can, we can talk about. So. Well, yeah, I, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, some of these uh, uh, characters in your book, but they should not, ex they should not uh, express their political bias so publicly in the media and the New York Times and other things, which is, an interesting subject. It's just, it's interesting how these people they uh, and they recycle. They, you know they walk out of the federal government and they become instantly consultants for major news networks. And we and and that's partly I think part of our problem. And I'm, I'm talking too much. Now, you know they go so if they if they don't like Trump, they're instantly on CNN and MSNBC. Mm. If they do like Trump, they're like instantly on Fox. And we yes. just we have these echo chambers. That yeah, divide us. But go ahead. Go ahead. But, but 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 you know the uh, so I, I remember I when I uh, when Edward Snowden's when uh, uh, Poitras uh, documentary about Snowden came out in you know, Citizen Four. I was I had the luck of seeing it in New York with an audience with a Q and A with a with a director herself, and then people in the audience. And then what shocked me was they were. I mean, this is Manhattan. This is like uh, Lincoln Center, uh, Lincoln Theater. There's the movie theater in the other, and people were asking the question. Uh, is the is the government watching me? Uh, they they had this sense of that they are under surveillance, and so, uh, for example, you know, this it's it, it, uh, it, 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 is it a legitimate question to wonder whether you are being given the metadata now, given the technology at our disposal, given the ways? I mean, uh, is it is it is it understandable that people that this notion of a deep state, or which is a covert state, or a dark uh, um, state, so to yes. speak, a shadow state. Uh, it, 
is that un is it understandable that people might have those feelings about it? Yes, after the you know wiretapping in the sixties and seventies that I talked about, after the Snowden wire, you know, after the post nine eleven, where there you know both parties have done it from from the Cold War to Bush after nine eleven without a judge's approval to Obama with a judge's approval with Snowden things. Yes, I'm going to do a little half glass half full thing. Uh, I think that that surveillance and privacy in the digital age is a huge political opportunity for somebody to come up with a bipartisan or, or a, a, you know, it's people on the right and left that are afraid of surveillance. And I think that's a real opportunity. There is a funny alliance in the Senate between Rand Paul, the libertarian senator from Kentucky, and Ron Wyden, the liberal Democrat um, from Oregon. They continually oppose, you know, uh, all these, the different surveillance uh, measures that go on. They're still kind of, it's weakened since 9-11, but there was that consensus that we needed to do these things for national security. So um, one last thing, a, a former NSA official I know, he said that um, soon the, the, the entities that will be collecting the most digital information about Americans, it's not the government, it's big tech. Mm -hmm. it, it's your, your phone calls, your Amazon searches, your Facebook pictures, your texts to your friends, all this data is being collected by uh, big tech. So here we are in the middle of this, you know, an amazing moment, this digital revolution, this new internet age. And I think that, you know, our political system has failed to come up with sort of rules of the road. What can the government surveil? What can a private company surveil? What are our rights as citizens? And, and I, we need to debate that and come up with uh, ground rules. Uh, people really want it. Yeah, I mean, uh, these these are these are huge issues. And before, know. <laughs> you know, to, you know, recently, only today, actually, I, I I discovered I had no clue. I was reading a book by Victor Davis Hanson, you know, on uh, the case for the case for Trump, which was published last year, to uh, to understand to give some perspective. And I discovered that he quotes uh, somebody called Philip Hamburger. Uh, I don't know whether you know of him. He is, a, he, he is a, he's a law professor at Columbia. He wrote two books about the administrative state. And mm -hmm. he, uh, and I haven't read, I didn't read the books, but I read an interview in Reason Magazine uh, with uh, Nick Gillipsy. And then he says, he says that it is one of the, it's a major threat to our civil liberties, to our democracy, uh, because of the way they do things. And you mentioned this, in your, maybe, maybe not, maybe you mentioned this in your book, you know, which, so for example, you have lawmakers creating a law in Congress or something, but then the details of, the, of those laws that they pass in Congress are handled by, this, by the civil servants and they do with them whatever they please, really, basically. So they, they, the, the Congress, the elected officials have very little control over, over what happens after they pass a bill, so to speak. And also he says, I don't know whether it's a coincidence or not, that this, the civil service or the federal government keeps expanding every time there's an... Uh, uh, inf let's say the inf enfranchisement of African Americans or women, mm -hmm. they keep expanding as as a as some sort of uh, as some sort of uh, uh, protection measure or, or protective measure against the mob, maybe against the perils of democracy, whatever, whatever. But that in itself, to me, is is one of the contradictions of having to live in a in a complex society and and government, right? So how does one manage a government the size of the United States, a country the size of the United States, if you don't have an extensive $22 million, 22 million uh, uh, person demo, uh, bureaucracy? The workforce. Yeah. Workforce. Yeah. It's, um, this is a central question. This is part of like President Trump's answer. So there are, there's about 9 million total in the government. A lot of them are military. There's 2 million civilians that are mm -hmm. permanent federal uh, people. And just the the deep state story, the kind of you know, it depends on where you are as a conservative. They include like state and local governments. If you include like teachers and police officers, it's even it's much it's even bigger. Mm. Um, the president is so right now four thousand people are political appointees. That's been the same for like a hundred years, and that that the idea was you know that that was created to stop corruption and you know the president's friends getting all the federal jobs. But that's, so what President Trump is proposing is a radical change from 4,000 political appointees 
who are hired or fired by the president, i.e. if you do something wrong, you can be fired, make it 100,000. On the laws being passed, I mean, I, I think that's true. I, I do think, um, you know, if, a, if, an administ if someone's implementing the law incorrectly, you know, these members of Congress have the ability to kind of call a hearing and, you know, you know demand subpoenas and, and, you know, attack these, these bureaucrats. Um, that, that are doing things that are in, improper. So I, I, I like to imagine that you want lots of, you want, to, you want checks and balances. You can have judges ruling that the way the law was interpreted was not the intent of the law. And then you, you get it thrown out and you hold the civil servants accountable that way. You have hearings where elected officials are sort of, you know, attacking them and uh, embarrassing them. Um, but that's the problem, like how you know, maybe you don't need permanent people. Maybe you have people change every four years in government, but how do we kind of govern our society when things like a pandemic and terrorist attacks happen? Is the answer career experts, the Tony Fauci thing? Or does that create an, you know, a self-interested group that wants to stay in power? Yeah, so basically the devil is in the details. So... <laughs> Some said the same thing about journalists that everybody gets, you know, you yes. get you get ensconced in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or, or but, the New Yorker. But, but or they say the same thing about like academia. Yes. But and I, uh, they, yes, absolutely. But they have in common academia right now and journalism and the media and the and, and the federal government or the administrative state, if you will, is we are all biased. We all and we that we have we have for the most part. Uh, giving up on on the absolute uh, necessity of maintaining some sort of detachment from the political passions and from uh, from those things. So now, I mean, absolutely. Now you you know which newspaper or magazine, like <laughs> you know, uh, is is on the left. It's absolutely committed to left leftist causes, and we know which TV station, for example, is more sympathetic to conservative causes. And so there is no, there's no place, and the federal government, the administrative state, I just read about some 90-some percent of, of, of the employees. First of all, they are protected by unions and by yes. another, another civil service kind of law yes. that protects them. So they're doubly protected. On top of that, 90-some percent of them in 19, 2016 voted for Clinton or something like that. So it's a, a vast, the vast, vast majority of them uh, lean Democratic. So if you are a president coming, knowing that fact, knowing the statistic, and, uh, and, and, know, and looking around and seeing 90% of the media is also uh, has, is liberal in its, in its persuasions and so on and so forth, and, and academics as well. Academics as well, there's very, they know everybody is now polarized, academia and in, 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 in the media, and even in federal government, everybody has his biases. So if you come in into a situation like this, the only place you have is Fox TV and and Breitbart News and what else? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree that that there needs to be more dispassion. That you know journalists need to you know stick to the facts. And I, it's sad how divided we are. I, I worry it's just gonna it'll make the country ungovernable. Back to the um, pandemic, and I I don't know whether masks are the answer. You know, a vaccine is going to come out. And 40% of Americans, you know, some on the right, some on the left, you know, won't take it. So I, I think the partisanship has gone too far. It's, you could argue it's costing us lives or, or needlessly destroying the economy, you know, if, uh, in terms of the pandemic, if you're on one side or the other of the debate. And um, the problem in the media is that, um, and I think in politics too, is that, you know, being to one extreme or the other, gets you votes. It gets you ratings. Um, you know, Fox is, I think they make a billion dollars a year. MSNBC makes nearly a billion dollars a year, CNN less. But but there's something about, you know, this time, I think the web where I think conspiracy, you know, travels faster and farther online than sort of nuanced, you know, facts. So um, anyway, my solution is at least for journalists to try to be less partisan. Um, and I know that people yeah. might laugh at that idea, but I, I don't know why I was I was reading recently. I don't know whether it's the essay, the interview with Philip Hamburger, or, or one of those books I was reading. Uh, 
I think people now go into journalism, and you probably know this, is that people, when, you, when people are being asked why they chose to be a journalist, a journalism major, it, one of the, one of the uh, common answers to it would be, because I want to change the world. Boy, well, hey, come on, that's good. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> that, that, that's, <laughs> that, is, that is not the right answer, because... <laughs> How about, you know, that you could, you know, uh, people starting companies are trying to change the world and, and make it in a better way. But no, it should be it shouldn't be like to bring down presidents, you know, like I, I know what you're saying. And I, I um, but I think we need to I'm, I'm trying to think of, you know, uh, members of the military tend to vote Republican. Um, if, if you look at the, you know, um, over the years, some I know I've met some military officers that won't even vote at all. It's it's sort of extraordinary their thing. I I guess it's you're going to have certain professions that draw people from certain um, political perspectives. I think it's incumbent on all of us to try to stick to facts and not be partisan. That is right. I, I don't want to get into like I and one thing you know that this whole like Twitter debate and and the you know. Um, what tweets Twitter is blocking. I don't want the government creating like a license for who's a journalist and who's not. I don't want the government mm -hmm. creating a license for who's an academic, who's a proper academic and who's not. Concentrations of power, um, you know, worry me. But I, I think, as I said in the beginning of this, like I, look, Donald Trump's election was a message to every, you know, mainstream journalist in the country, every, uh, professor in the country, every economist, you know, sociologist, uh, and frankly, like politician that, you know, a, you know, that half the country felt that the establishment was selling them out, felt that journalists and professors and all these members, of, you know, and we want to think we got to our jobs th through merit. But, you know, that's the, you know, there's a, there's, the problem is, not, you know, this isn't something that just Donald Trump has made up. I think he's, you know, taking advantage of it, but we have to think about bias and yeah, in, in our work. Well, I mean, uh, Victor Davis Hanson in his book, the case says in 2016, the richest counties in the United States all basically voted for Clinton, the richest, the wealthiest counties uh, yes. in the United States. And yesterday, was it today in the New York Times, they had this big, long, long article about the who's voting for whom, and all the richest counties also in the United States, you know, anybody who makes above, I think it's sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year or something, you know, the, the yeah. vast majority of them are voting for Biden. So it's interesting. It's the... the oh, so it's changed? No. Or no, no, sorry, it hasn't changed. It's it, the same pattern. As it it, it, it yeah. is the same. And, yeah. and so I... But, the, you know, I just recently read a fast... I mean, everybody should read it. It's, it's a... He was a member of the... Trump administration. His name is uh, Michael Anton, and you probably heard. Right? Yes, he's a, he was a spokesman at the National Security Council. Yeah, he wrote this book at the stakes. You know, America on the verge of no return. You know, basically, and and he begins the first chapter is a big, long, long chapter about what's happening in California right now, which is basically a one-party state, all in you know, a deep blue state. You know. Uh, uh, where with where the high tech and Hollywood are concentrated, but it is the most unequal, one of the most unequal states in the country. Homelessness has the vast majority of homeless people in the country, and people, and and then middle classes are taxed out of existence. Basically, they have to flee the state to go some other place to be able to make a living, and so the conditions on the ground, the the most liberal state in the country, bro, oh, arguably the most liberal state in the country, is one of the most unequal. Uh, ha has a host of social issues, problems that it cannot solve. So if that is the model of the future, the Californication of the future, basically, of the country, of the United States, it's a huge problem. Uh, so what is the model that is being offered to these middle classes? And on top of that, the implication there is the middle classes get taxed and they, they end up paying for the services that go to the homeless people or immigrants, or illegal immigrants. The super rich, the oligarchs don't pay taxes or, or they, re, they, repatri they, they uh, repatriate their money, their profit to other countries. You have to incentivize them to bring them back in the United States. So the middle class is squeezed on both sides on both sides by, mm -hmm. by uh, paying taxes to pay for services. And also, this is the debate about immigration, by, Im by importing cheap, uh, low-scale or no-scale uh, uh, illegal immigrant labor. 
So they end up also suffering from those consequences. So I haven't seen, I mean, I've read a little bit of Biden's agenda uh, and the, the progressive elements in it, but it seems to me that, you know, there is a sort of a silence, a consensual silence over the issue of the huge disparities of wealth uh, in the United States and who ends up paying for the services and so on. I think that, yeah, and, and uh, that one of the reasons, you know, Trump won in 2016 was this sense of tremendous and growing inequality in the country. Um, and and it's two visions. I mean, you know, in that, that uh, Democrats generally talk about, you know, raising taxes, at least on the rich, and then that the government is providing systems that equalize the country, uh, you know, I would, and I mean, in a way, I'm hoping that that the, and I'm, I'm going to constantly try to be upbeat here, but that, you know, in a red state, you know, with a smaller government, that that, you know, folks will leave California and, and go to red states. That you have this, these kind of laboratories in each states to try to to carry out, you know, these different these different programs. Um, and I agree, it's it's, you know, Trump. One and resonated because he talked about inequality. There's, you know, debate about whether his policies would 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 solve the problem. But I um I would, you know, it's it's um I'm trying to think when you talk about with the coverage of these these proposals from the left and the right. I mean, I think yeah. there. I, I do think that that one of the side effects of the pandemic or the intensity of the coverage is that there's more kind of focus on the pandemic, um, you know, and, and that, you know, there's, there isn't as much coverage of sort of each side's economic proposals and, and there should be more because so many of our problems, I think, and so much of our division stems from that inequality. Yeah. And also because of the nature of the media now, I feel like because of their permanent quest for ratings and, and so on and, and it's because they're all for profit, you know, uh, uh, in most of them, uh, if not all of them. So uh, what it is, is like we end up, we are not addressing the real issues. There's a tremendous amount of noise that passes for, that passes for political, for ideology or political positions. But if you look very carefully, the main, the structural issues that are hampering and that are weakening the country or the nation, or maybe even the world entirely, they're not being addressed with the kind of seriousness that they deserve. So what we end up, there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know sound and fury, if you will, uh, over, over minor issues, like, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of heat. But the big issues, the structural issues, for example, one, of, one statistic, I just published something today in Morocco, in the, in the, in the Morocco newspaper I shared with you. Yes. I mean, recently, r recently there is, there's this big stunning statistic that in, during the pandemic, between some 88 million to 114 million people sort of fell into extreme poverty, which is defined in the United States as somebody making a $1.90 90 or less a day. So, add, so now we have, the world has more than 700 million people who live in extreme poverty. Meanwhile, the number of billionaires rose uh, by, you know, a few hundred or something. Now they have, now we have a world with 2,000 some billionaires who own 10, more than $10 trillion of wealth. That is, I mean, meanwhile, this is happening and in the background where we're mm -hmm. totally consumed by the COVID-19 statistics. And yeah. this big debate yeah. and everything else. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, there is pressure on the news organizations just to uh, to get ratings. Um, I, I would say that critics of the president. We we live in the the attention economy. It's who can get your attention, and the the web is this amazing uh, you know a portal to providing information to us. But it, it it does political extremes get the most attention, the most sort of. Uh, shocking things. So I, I do agree that inequality, one of the biggest issues of our time, isn't getting the kind of debate uh, it deserves. And I think the, um, again, some, well, some folks will blame Nancy Pelosi for <laughs> saying things that the, that the president needs is mentally unstable and she's going to create a commission. You know, Trump's tweets, you know, get everybody all upset, uh, you know, and, and then that's more noise. Um, 
you know, our political process isn't working as it should be. And I, I worry about the impact of that uh, long term. There's a character in my book, and, and again, people might not trust him, but um, his name is, this gets, and this is the whole question, like, do we need FBI agents? Do we need police or not? Uh, my brother was a policeman for several years. My, my brother-in-law was a policeman. And these are people who generally speaking, I mean, there's a horrific problem with racial discrimination and police abuse and, you know, the killing of George Floyd, but, you know, they try to be, they tried to be apolitical um, and just do their jobs correctly and, and serve the public. Um, Tom O'Connor, the character in the book, he was an FBI agent. He joined a few years before 9-11, um, but his career is he's sort of investigating the first Al-Qaeda bomb bombing in East Africa he sent to Nairobi. Then the USS Cole is attacked in Yemen. He investigates that. Uh, then on the 9-11 attacks, he's in Washington. He responds to the Pentagon and is part of the recovery effort there. Um, you know, he, he and other FBI agents, they, they collect, sorry to be graphic, but 3,000 bags of human remains. He feels that part of his job is to collect people's uh, bodies so that their families can, can mourn them properly. Uh, he's sent to Iraq after, you know, the invasion, trains uh, police there. Uh, he's also assigned to investigate the shooting of Iraqis by Blackwater security guards. Uh, he comes back to the U.S. and he investigates, you know, racial extremists, um, neo-Nazis. So he does this whole career, um, but he um, was one of the people, there's been a whole issue with 9-11 first responders, some of them developing cancer, firefighters and cops, some of the FBI agents have developed that as well. There was a famous court hearing where John Stewart went and yelled at all the members of Congress and, you know, uh, a couple of years ago and Tom O'Connor was sitting right behind him. So Tom O'Connor recently retired from the FBI after 23 years. And what I, when I talked to the FBI agents for this book, they were kind of, it wasn't that they, some would think, oh, they hate Trump because Trump attacked the FBI or they love Trump because they're law enforcement and law enforcement tends to be conservative. The FBI was sort of as divided as the rest of the country. And they said to me, and I, again, I, this is like the central question, you know, can you have a political police and FBI agents? Most of them were just disgusted with our political class, Republicans and Democrats mm. alike. They were like, I, they were very upset when the government shutdown happened early in, mm. you know, Nancy Pelosi and Trump again. And they were like, I just want to go kick down doors and arrest bad guys. And yeah. so I asked O'Connor, well, what about you retired now? Would you ever, you know, run for Congress and try to clean up this, the swamp, you know, the cesspool? And O'Connor said, no, I want to do something that has meaning. Yeah, I see what you that's a really bad sign for our democracy. And I worry that if you have people on the right and the left, you know, more and more alienated, you know, right now we, we, so we have a huge political division in this country. Next Tuesday, you know, the miracle of democracy, there will be a peaceful vote and we will, there will be like a mandate. I agree that, that a lot of people resisted the results of the 2016 election. They, they were sort of shocked and offended by it. Um, I, cause of my experiences, you know, covering Bosnia and covering Afghanistan, like it's not a game and accepting the results of a fair election whether it was 2016 or 2020, keeps us from violence. You know, I mean, we, we hopefully have evolved beyond fighting it out for who gets to be the king. But I, um, I worry about, you know, the, the depth of division and the people that are stoking it, the politicians yeah. that stoke it, the, the, you know, it, and the media, it's, it's not a game and it's, it, it, it unnerves me how vitriolic things have become. I agree. And uh, one of the, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much to be said about this topic, and endlessly, you and I, I'm sure. But, you know, the thing is, you know, we are always running, you know, linguistically and conceptually, we are always like uh, a few years, if not decades, behind reality. And that is a very common situation. For example, you know, nowadays, the, uh, for example, the New York Times yesterday, only today, I think that not yesterday, Sunday, they had a... Uh, they had an editorial about rest in peace for GOP. I don't know whether you saw that. It's like, it's like I didn't read it. Yes. So I don't, so anyway, oh, and I, and they, go they, ahead. They, so they, in other words, they are lamenting. They are in a, in a nostalgic fashion the old 
genteel kind of Republican Party where people were reasonable and so on and so forth. But meanwhile, the one, the one down the road from me. Uh, yeah. Walker's Point. <laughs> yes. I'm not, I don't live on Walker, or I'm not staying in Walker, uh, on Walker's Point. But anyway. <laughs> and, and, and it's too bad that they get hijacked and uh, bullied, basically, by Trump. But in fact, when you read a book like Michael Anton's or even Congressman Matt Gates from Rhode Island, they are, these are, these are pop, they're both against the establishment Republican Party. They say that party should, that it, unless it changes dramatically, it has no place anymore in for the future. It's a party of the past where, where they're still concerned with tax, uh, uh, tax uh, sort of uh, tax reductions or tax uh, credit or whatever, taxation and global free trade and stuff like that, lower taxes. But that is a concept, that's a party of the past. That agenda is gone. Now, in fact, they are closer to AOC in some, in some of their, in some of their thinking then they are even AOC today. Yesterday, somebody quotes her Jenkins uh, from the from the Wall Street Journal saying, "At some point, she said, uh, I can't believe I'm in a party. I'm in the same party as Joe Biden, <laughs> you know, kind of thing." <laughs> so, in other words, there is a tremendous change happening within both parties. They are right. moving. They are moving in interesting directions. In a, together, they are they are converging towards a progressive movement in the United States. That's why I call that article a new American revolution very hopeful, but everybody is stuck in a vocabulary, in a language that reflects a reality that's, that's almost passé. I would, I would agree with you. And I think that um, the kind of labels and the partisanship kind of cause people to not seriously consider the ideas that are, that are coming out. And, and, and part of the problem is that it's, it's not that you're, you know, you, and I don't want to, I'm not talking about kind of a genteel past, but I do think like you can, re, re, you can disagree respectfully with each other. You don't have to say your opponent is stupid or unpatriotic or like, you know, mm -hmm. a liar. And I, I, it's, I, I, I think there's a part of it. It's the web. I love the web. I, I don't want to see censorship. I'm, I'm, I'm biased as a journalist. But I do think people say things online that they would never say to each other's faces. They say very sort of vitriolic, nasty things. And it, there's something about, um, you know, online communications that, that leads people to sort of, you know, um, hover in these like-minded communities that are sort of echo chambers. Uh, I'm not an expert on tech. I, you know, there's just now the Justice Department has, you know, filed the antitrust case against Google. But I think it's 90% of the web sort of exists on those big four platforms on uh, Facebook uh, and Google um, and Twitter. And I, I think Microsoft, you know, e-commerce, everything, it's dominated by those things. So maybe we'll have the right and the left agreeing on kind of trust busting with big tech. Um, I, I agree with you that I think there's a political opportunity there you know, the Ron Wyden, Ron, you know, Rand Paul thing. I don't know if Matt Gates and AOC are going to agree on anything, but the system isn't working. You know, Donald Trump rode that to Washington. There's a debate now about whether he, he has the answers, but we should be listening more to each other about what the answers are. Um, yes. Instead and, of just looking at these labels. And on that issue of big tech, I mean, look, it's, it looks as if, well, like, probably that is, the, the First Amendment doesn't apply to private corporations and companies, they can. So even if you, even if you split those companies into different smaller smaller companies or whatever, it's, you still don't have a First Amendment rights on that company, so to speak. So how could you? These platforms have become so universal, so indispensable. In fact, more indispensable. There is nothing comparable to them, like Twitter and Facebook. So yet, yet it's another contradiction of living in a hyper-capitalist environment without, without robust public alternatives to them, right? Well, it's, I mean, people would disagree with the sort of European model. I mean, they, I know when people, I say Europeans are not conservatives <laughs> and they go, oh, no, no. <laughs> but they've been much more aggressive at uh, regulating tech uh, privacy. Uh, I'm not saying we should, we should you know, I, I think that if there is an election and people run and they want big tech broken up and they want more privacy, you know, the will of the voters should matter, the, the will of elected officials. And so they should they should take that on. I, you know, the robber barons of the late 1800s that, that we've been through periods of, of concentrations of power. And I, I think they're they're generally, you know, very, very 
very dangerous. Yes. No, I, I, uh, it's a, uh, well, it, it's a very interesting moment. I, I don't know how you feel about it. I, I'm actually hopeful. I mean, uh, that uh, the future, to me, you know, to me, Donald Trump is a catalyst for something at, at worst or at best. You know, uh, he, he, he introduced, he, he disrupted a consensus. And now I don't think there's any going back to, uh, uh, you know, the years. So what, what's going to come out in the post-Trump era in terms of political alignments, ideologies, conceptions of the future, what's a good, a good society, uh, is back into play, what I think. I, I agree. And I think that... Um... I'll, I'll tell you a couple scary stories that makes yes. me worry about, um, you know, if we don't kind of turn the volume down and talk more substantively about, you know, uh, solutions. Um, you mentioned, you know, my, I was, when I was reporting in Afghanistan and I went to interview a Taliban commander, I wanted to hear his views. Um, you know, I was finishing a book. I just gotten married to my, my wife, um, you know, and this wonderful become part of this wonderful family down here in Kennebunkport. And um, I go to this interview, the Taliban uh, commander, he had interviewed European journalists before me, but, and not kidnapped them. But as soon as I arrived with two Afghans, I was kidnapped. But it was fascinating talking to the Taliban for the seven months I was there. They were, you know, completely convinced that the 9-11 attacks had been staged um, to create an excuse for the U.S. military to invade countries across the Islamic world. They sincerely believed that U.S. troops were there to forcibly convert Afghans to Christianity. They thought Afghan women were being forced to work as prostitutes on U.S. military bases. And then the, my strange personal experience was, um, or years earlier, I was covering the war in Bosnia. Um, I was uh, reporting on the actions of Bosnian Serb forces. They were Christian nationals. So these are you know, the Taliban or Muslims extremists and then uh, Christian extremists. I was investigating these mass killings around Srebrenica. I found a mass grave. The local Serb police arrested me at the mass grave. So then they, I was held only 10 days by the, 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 the Christian extremists. They said, each side said, you're a spy. The, the Christian extremists thought there was like a secret Arab OPEC conspiracy. I was being paid by them to make up these mass killings. They, they actually happened. I wasn't making anything up. And then the Taliban thought I was also like a spy um, making things up. But what those experiences convinced me was that um, there's certain, I think, people who, who uh, you know, like power or like, you know, abusing people or sadistic or whatever. But what it struck me, and then back to those FBI agents that FAO Schwartz interviewed, was that the biggest danger for I think human beings is our ability to rationalize. So whether it was FBI agents in the 60s, you know, Bosnian Serbs in the 90s, the Taliban in the 2000s, they all had rationalized that their way of life was under threat from some secret conspiracy from, you know, internationally or from overseas and that the only way to kind of do, you know, to preserve that way of life was to, you know, resort to violence. And I, I worry about how heated the rhetoric is on the left and the right, that that's, you know, we could get to that point in this country. So I, um, I agree with you, Trump is a disruptor. Um, I worry we're in this cycle of, yes. I also think the Republic will stand, like whoever wins next Tuesday, you know, take a deep breath. And, and if Trump wins again, he wins again. I hope it's a clear winner. <laughs> that's yes. my thing because I worry about a close election and, and the lack of trust now. People won't, won't believe the vote totals. Yeah. And, and, and it's basically, you're right. I mean, there's something sociologically speaking that's happening to American society, which, which in, in, in turn is affecting the rest of the world, by the way. I mean, it's whatever happens in the United States ends up being adopted, both good and bad, overseas in other countries. So every, because it's, the, the power of marketing in the United States has is absolutely unbelievable. Can't believe how many friends of mine calling me, telling me how they feel about the election, how they feel about Trump, for example. And I say, well, how is how is Trump affecting you <laughs> wherever you may be, whether you're in Morocco, or France, or Spain? It's it's interesting how the biases of the New York Times, for example, end up being the the uh, the, the agenda or the biases of the entire of a lot a large portion of the world's population, at, at least the educated part. Well, <laughs> uh, anyway, it's like. 
you know, there's so much uh, to be said uh, to be said about this. But now, one of the questions of the final one, probably to me, is the you know the 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 notion of democracy that we have, or we believe we have, is can't it's it's constantly clashing against the reality of managing a nation or a state, a nation, or having a, or developing a state to managing a nation. So. Um, so it's it's a it's a convenient myth to have that we devolve, we we are in we are in control of our fate of our destinies in a democratic society, but if we if we're not for that administrative state, so in a in a different kind yes. of way, then we will end up being a failed state. And, uh, and it, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if we no, I mean it's been a debate from since the day this country was created. How big a government do we need? Mm. You know, I think there has to be some kind of government, some, you know, police officers, schools, yes. road, roads constructed. Many, many conservatives feel it's getting way too big in, in California. You know, um, Democrats say it's, you know, too small in, in red states. So, you know, and then, and this is partly what I go out in the book is how powerful should a president be? Should a president be able to have the CIA and FBI do whatever they feel is needed to protect the country? Or is it good to have judges in these congressional committees kind of making problems and messing things up? I, I tend to think you want a, a dispersal of power, that, mm -hmm. that a division of power between the three branches is good, whether it's economic or political power, um, it's dangerous. And I think a, you know, a dispersal of power um, in the media is good also. And I, I just want to give my little spiel on the, on the media too. Y you know, it's one of the things I think that fails in the, <laughs> One of the, the old models, I mean, you, you'll, you know, uh, I'll, I'll let everybody go soon, but mm -hmm. you're citing having these editorial pages of the, when we we're both so old, we read the wall street journal and the New York times <laughs> younger people, your students are like, what these guys, you know, we should be reading Instagram, but anyway, <laughs> and I know those are pictures. So anyway, <laughs> um, having these editorial pages in these yeah. newspapers that are yeah. very, political. I didn't read RIP Republican Party. Just personally, I wanted news. I wanted information. So the one thing I'll make, I think part of the, so right now in the news pages of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, there's separate sections. Mm -hmm. One reason I would argue, again, if you're conservative, you know, you know, trust the news pages of the Wall Street Journal more so than like things you're seeing mm -hmm. on online and from friends on Facebook because we are publishers. Mm -hmm. So when I edit or run a story in the New York in the New Yorker magazine and we slander someone, we can be sued for defamation and libel. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say that the laws are too liberal and we, you know, it's very hard to win one of those suits, but it really is a check on what a newspaper or most TV stations or magazines we have lawyers reading everything, every story that we're running. And what's amazing and what sort of, again, this how do we govern the inter internet age, there, there's no Twitter, Facebook, Google has no responsibility mm -hmm. whatsoever when they post false or defamatory information. You know, of course, it's people's First Amendment rights to publish things. You know, I don't know the answers, but so I would say if you're on the right, trust the Wall Street Journal editorial pages because there is a, there's a legal you know, yes. penalty we, we face. On the left, you know, the New York Times, and there's so much floating around on the web that's driving some of the extremism. And then I, I think the opinion pages of both um, papers just lob, you know, crazy things at each other. You see it on Fox and MSNBC and, and CNN, and and that's a return to kind of traditional, just the facts journalism. You, Republicans and Democrats, again, people agree on some things. They want less partisanship in just their basic news coverage. So, you know, we need more reporters and, and sort of fewer columnists and, um, and reporters need to get out more. I mean, they were hanging out in the coasts of the country, you know, and were shocked when, when Trump ran. Um, I've got colleagues out in Ohio and Florida right now kind of covering this race and, you know, we're, we're trying not to make that mistake, but I, all of our institutions need to look at themselves and reform themselves because you know, back to the core thing we talked about. People feel that the country's in unequal. They feel economics are unequal. They feel that their rights aren't respected. Their privacy isn't respected. And, you know, 
everyone in the country needs to not not dismiss those complaints, but take them seriously and think of how can each of us in our own profession do a better way to address them. Wow. I, with those words, David, <laughs> perfect I, conclusion. I, wish I had all the answers, but perfect I, I would conclusion. say yeah, more no. facts, you know, and be my, my little mantra is like, be skeptical of what you read, be yeah. skeptical of politicians, be skeptical of journalists, yes. but let's not be <clears throat> cynical about each other. No, absolutely. And question each other's motives. So be skeptical. Amen. Substance, read, look for other opinions, but mm. we're getting cynical about each other and, and that's going to unravel the country, I fear. Yes. Well, what a, what a pleasure.